Hi, my name is Nitin Khanna and I'm the CEO of a company called Merger Tech Advisors. Uh, it's a two-year-old investment bank that's focused primarily on entrepreneurs, technology entrepreneurs, running companies between 3 million to 50 million in revenue. We felt it was a massively underserved marketplace from uh, uh, getting a very superior level of banking services down to those, those entrepreneurs and really felt there was a niche in the market that we could, we could enter. And it all happened, uh, the, the idea for the company came about because I'd run a previous software company called Sabre, uh, which had done a lot of M&A transactions. We'd, we'd sold the company in pieces three different times and we'd bought five companies over the lifetime of that company. And I eventually sold the whole company to EDS in 2007 and worked for six more months or so for EDS and then took a year off. And in the year that I took off, I gained a real, uh, real passion for entrepreneurs and entrepreneurialism. I, uh, joined the PSU, uh, started teaching there on a course called Entrepreneurship for Engineers, uh, started working with the mayor's office and PDC, Starbucks, Thai, OEN, SCM, just everybody here in town, seeing how I could help our entrepreneurs. And what I really noticed was that there were a number of organizations and people helping entrepreneurs to what I consider the first two-thirds legs of a company's life, and that is getting them to sustainability or profitability, getting the, you know, getting the entrepreneur and the company off the ground, and then another number of organizations and sets of people helping them get profitable and, and sustainable over the long haul. But the third leg where wealth is truly created for an entrepreneur, which is through the exit, was lacking in terms of whether it was organizations, or help, or mindset, or even people knowing that there was an opportunity out. People had new ideas, they'd grown tired of their companies, they had no generational transfer. So these were people who run their companies for a long time and didn't even realize that an $8 million technology company, which has been around for 30 years, can get them four, five, six, seven million dollars $7 And so, so as, I, as I worked with the entrepreneurs, I found that there was a, a real gap. And then looking back to my experience at Sabre, I realized that when we were smaller doing M&A, we truly had to work very, very hard to find a senior banking team to represent us. So mid-market bank may represent us, but we typically got you know, the junior team or the team that wasn't technology focused exclusively or knew how to market technology firms. So I was doing this personal passion stuff and doing a lot of mentoring, a lot of angel investing, a lot of talks you know, for OEN and Starbucks, teaching at PSU, and just, just working with the whole community and finding at that point, which was described as, you know, the Portland problem is, you know, people invest in Portland companies, but then ask them to leave, how can we change the ecosystem? I believe since then it's changed, and there's a number of companies here in town uh, that are proving it day in and day out. So, married those two things up together in, uh, in uh, the fall of 2009, and uh, launched, uh, took an existing firm, which a friend of mine runs a, a large technology investment bank, but he had a small subsidiary, really focused on this problem, but not in a mission-focused way, as I described it, you know, three to 50 million, primarily working with founder-led CEOs, not management CEOs who've been brought in, uh, you know, later. Really trying to find a solution to somebody who wanted to go work on a new idea, find free time, or, or basically just retire. And so took that firm over, it was called m and Forum, uh, rebranded it, refocused it, hired people into it, changed the personnel around. It really came out as a brand new company in March of 2010. So we've really been doing this for about 18 months. And so that's what the company's about. It it's really has solved a need in the marketplace. It just took off as soon as we came out with it. And when we explained the problem we were solving you know, to our client base, uh, we, we quickly became one of the fastest investment banks in the area. And the number of deals we're now doing actively, I think, puts us amongst the largest uh, niche investment banks for deals under 50 million. Entrepreneurism and whether it gets easy if you're a serial entrepreneur or if you've had success, or, or if it becomes easier to kind of, the, the sticky mud of entrepreneurialism, whether it's easier to, to step forward. And, and my thinking is, and this is what every entrepreneur should know, you know, first time startup, no funds raised, it is very, very difficult a lot of the times. You could have been very successful, you could have reached 100 million in revenues, the problems change, the doubts continue to be there. And I think that's very important to understand that you may look at somebody who's been very successful and think they've kind of figured it out. But figuring it out is truly about just putting one foot in front of the other, facing that problem, looking ahead, having a plan for what might occur. And so I think uh, th that's my key point, that it's hard at any stage, it's hard at any size, uh, and the people who are successful truly, it's that quote about 
uh, you know, perspiration and 1% inspiration. You just have to keep doing. When people do get stuck on that point, uh, when I'm mentoring folks and they're like, my idea isn't good enough, I'm going to change my idea, I ask them a very basic question. I said, do you think there are five people on earth, if we got the right five people on earth together, they could build a $10 million janitorial business in two years? And the answer always is yes. There are five people on earth who have enough connections, relationships, knowledge about the janitorial business that they could build a $5, $10 million business in a couple of years. So that means there is, you can take the idea of a simple thing as a janitorial business, you know, cleaning toilets in a commercial building and grow it to $10 million. So the, the, the people are super fretting about the idea. I think uh, it's, it's important to understand that it is about really pushing forward with the core mission, the core problem that you feel you're solving. Of course, over time, it'll, uh, it'll change and you learn more from your customers, but you still have to have a core mission about why is it that you're doing what you do, and as long as you have that, you know, you're able to get up in the morning and push forward. And one of the organizations that I'm part of here in town is Ty Oregon. Uh, it's, I think, a relatively young organization for Portland, but an incredibly large and successful organization worldwide, having access to all kinds of leaders in all, you know, all the different communities. Uh, here in town, they're young, but they've gotten the right set of people to be their charter members. I just joined their board recently, uh, along with Diane Freeman from Voyager Capital. And they've been a real change, force of, for change, and good here. We recently invested in Geoloki over a weekend. I mean, I think I got the first call from Nitin, Rai, and, and Kant about an opportunity to invest in Geoloki. We had a term on Thursday morning. We had a term sheet out on Friday, which the company accepted on Monday. That kind of speed of funding, you know, Portland hasn't seen. It's been one of my main things that I've talked about in the community is how slow the fund fundraising here it is to be able to fund a company that quickly has been incredible. Uh, they're also, you know, really highly focused on building a connection to the Bay Area to let them know how many professionals, senior professionals there are, are here to mentor companies so that when those folks invest in companies that are in Portland, they don't feel the need to pull the companies out. Uh, so yeah, whether it's Audio Name or it's Approved or it's Geoloki uh, or a ton of other companies that, that Tire Organ's helping, I'm, I'm really happy that they're here and, and proud to be a part of it. You know, it's, it's interesting, uh, when, when you think of hurdles, they seem so much more apparent to you when they're in front of you than when you look back. When you look back, they seem to have been solved. But of course, there's a number of hurdles that any entrepreneur and any person overcomes in life personally and professionally uh, to get wherever they are. You know, I, uh, uh, you know, whether people consider this a hurdle or not, I've been away from home since fourth grade. You know, went to boarding school and came to the States when I was 17. Um, and, and really I felt it was pretty scrappy and I think that was one of the things that gave me great ability to be an entrepreneur. Um, but, but probably the biggest hurdles I've had to overcome as an entrepreneur is learning you know, how to let go of people, really be, being good at, at running a firm in which you can hire friends on the front end, but sub subsequently if they're not working out, letting them go. And every time that happens, it's one of the biggest things that makes you wonder whether you know you're, you're cut out for entrepreneurialism. On the other hand, if you can't do it, you probably aren't either. So both at Sabre and here at Mergetech already, we've had, uh, you know, we've had to, to have friends part ways. People are really good friends and who can't need to be friends, but it really you have to look at it as a way of, of setting people free to do what they're best at. Because almost every friend who we've let go has gone on to do greater and better things than they were doing in our firm. So if you can internalize that, it makes it easy. But for me, it has been and continues to be probably the biggest hurdle. Um, but it's not one that we've let stand in our way. We've, we've actually gotten, you know, on the technical side, pretty good at, at finding out which employees work and which don't. You know, on the personal side, I got divorced a couple of years ago, uh, last year. And that's, that's a big hurdle I think anybody has to overcome in their life, especially with young kids. And so, you know, Starting merger tech at the same time you're getting divorced. Thankfully, you know, my ex-wife and I are very amicable. It works out great for the kids. But that, that is the single biggest personal hurdle I've had to overcome. And I just can't even see anything professionally that matched up to how difficult that was to bounce back and have a learning that, that you can make a mistake, bounce back. And, and it's not even a mistake. You know, it, it, it just didn't work um, and, and move forward again. And it's, it's a great lesson I think lots of viewers uh, can take that uh, uh, that was probably the hardest thing. You know. 
That is truly a hard question for me to answer. You know, we, I have been in an entrepreneurial family and been raised as an entrepreneur almost since I was four years old. So our family was in business, multiple businesses, uh, suiting and shirting, which in India basically is a fabrics business, motorcycle parts. Uh, we had kind of a monopoly on wood and coal in North India. Uh, so we'd get wood and coal from wherever it, it was found in India and then have a monopoly on selling it to the kilns in North India. So grew up in this just crazy, tumultuous entrepreneurial family. Whichever uncle you looked at was doing a different business. So the basic concepts of cash and selling a product for more than it costs you and, and accounts receivable and collecting, just is some fundamental things were drummed into our brain, both my brother and I, who's been my co-founder in both businesses. And, and really without him, the business is going to have been successful. But it feels as I work with entrepreneurs now, not having those role models at a young age. You know, you look up and you're like, well, that person solved that problem this way. And we had eight, nine, ten people to pick from. Uh, because in the evening, in the joint families in India, you'd all sit around and talk about the individual businesses because they were still family owned. But, you know, this uncle ran that and your dad ran this and his brother ran this and your mom's brother ran a slightly different business. That is something that I just don't know how we can truly get in people's way. So when, when I look at that learning, I just feel I've had an easier time of it than most in terms of being tripped up. I mean, I really feel we look back and it's not that, you know, your growth for any company comes like this. It absolutely goes like this, 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 up, down, up, down. But where major, major mistakes could have been made, I think they were avoided because of this experiential very young learning that school was school and and most of us kids you know most of my cousins and i starting right about eighth grade would actually spend a few hours at one of the companies um, and most kids of of in our culture of, of that community a lot of them actually drop out of school at nine and ten and go straight straight to work uh, i happen to be more academically inclined <laughs> fortunately or unfortunately and so i came to the states for my undergrad and my master's in engineering but, uh, but that learning allowed for a level of understanding of what a business takes. And, and that too, I think, is one interesting point that I talk about a bit is the word entrepreneurship, I think, often needs to be balanced by the word businessman or businesswoman just as often. Because, you know, in our parents' day and age, a business person basically got up in the morning, created a product or service and sold it for more than it was worth and collected the cash. And sometimes I think by talking about entrepreneurism, we've, we've, we've confused ourselves because now we think it's about fundraising and a board and a board of advisors. And, and I, I think we so many times I've talked to entrepreneurs and they're completely lost in what their calendar looks like. And I'm like, show me your calendar is one of the first things when I'm going to be mentoring. And I'm going to be, where in here is, are you selling and marketing and collecting and developing your product? Because it's just confused, and it starts with the smallest of our entrepreneurs. And that's, I think, unfortunate. I really think in this day and age, we need to do a better job of first teaching business fundamentals. You're a business person, you know? You've got to make a profit. And then subsequently saying, yes, there are some ideas that absolutely need capital, and there are some ways of raising capital. But I think we've totally gotten the cart before the horse. And I don't know if that answered your question, and, uh, but. But, but that's, that's where I, I feel that it's hard for me to answer the question because uh, whether by luck or good fortune, um, you know, we've been, we've been able to be successful at the businesses my brother and I have tried. The resource I personally find to be most useful, without which the companies won't run, of course, is my brother. I mean, the, we, we break down perfectly down the middle and with a slight bit of overlap, uh, for me to be able to run vision and mission and culture and sales and marketing and him to have the excellence in operations and in delivery of those things that I sell and management of the culture that's created uh, and hiring which he's very good at. I just think that, that you know, we talk about co-founders a lot but to have brothers who trust each other uh, implicitly, who can talk to each other multiple times a day, who can talk outside of office hours has been very, very central and core to our success. And I really feel those guys who don't have this inside CEO, which he is, and I'm the outside CEO, don't have a resource. You know, when we look at resources, uh, that, that truly are game-changing for me. Um, so that's the number one resource I've had 
I feel, in starting both companies. You know, we've been able to take tasks, and give it to each other, uh, and to be able to do them. This, the second resource um, is is coming up with business plans. I think the ability, as I said before, to come up with business plans, just a way of thinking that allows us to get started without the, you know, the need for outside capital. And it's not true for every business, but, but really in our businesses we've been able to get started with outside capital and that therefore really own the equity outright to speak between him and I, which at the tail end of the business is, is a really valuable thing to have, uh, whether you distribute it employees or when you sell, but to have that equity to hand out at the right time uh, is an incredible resource at that point as well. So I'd say, you know, holding on to equity as a resource as much as possible till the point it gets as valuable as it can, and then handing out a little bit of it, uh, and having somebody you can lean on during the hard times, somebody you can do the work, and somebody you trust to get the work done, it's probably the two biggest resources. Yeah, the group taken it back. That's a very interesting question. As uh, uh, as I was getting divorced last year, I went and met with a lot of uh, senior leaders in the community and asked them about their difficult times in their lives. And it was very interesting. People between ten and twenty years older than me, and especially for those who'd gone through a divorce, I was listening very intently as to what their answers was. And to a person. Every single person I talked to said the hardest time in their life had been after they had sold their company, right? So they put divorce, when they look back at it 20 years later, because especially selling a very successful company, you absolutely do lose your identity and you have to work very hard to reestablish it. So whether you go into angel investing or go on the lecture circuit, every subsequent career somehow feels for a few years not as interesting and engaging as running a 200, 500 thousand employee company where you're winning contracts every day and, and people are calling you to solve problems and so it almost feels like stepping off a moving train and most employee, employees think you've left them but actually they stay together and you've gotten off the train and the train keeps moving and it's still having success and it's still progressing as an organization. So I had those two things happen simultaneously. Um, and. And so the abyss that you still stare into with a startup coming off such a successful company at Sabre, when we sold it, we had 1,500 employees the last day before I left work. And to lose kind of management and we were winning well over 90% of our contracts. So I felt like an NFL coach uh, who would go in and had these 11 awesome you know, executives who could run the whole company and, and, and I was basically coaching. And immediately the day after the sale, you completely lost that team and you're no longer coaching so I could kind of feel why people keep coaching their whole lives. That's the problem I'd say, you know, I haven't, I haven't fully overcome. Then the nice thing is Merger Tech's very successful and it's on its way and so you, having done it before you see the markers of success before the success happens and all the markers are there and that gets me excited to go to work but I am also excited to see it actually grow, you know, to a larger level and so that's, that's something, you know, you look, look down every day and say, will I get to be age 60, 70, and my, the only story I have for my kids is, hey, I built a great company and I sold it when I was 37. Or will you be able to add on more stories to that and then say that? And, and everybody does, but it's an abyss that I think is pretty scary. And I talk to people every day who either exited companies or sold companies and who are just in a two-year spin of what does my next life look like. And, and I think I'm glad to be emerging out of that over the last six months as we found this is a real business with a real need which people are willing to pay for and we can be successful with and have a great reputation around. But, but those days still exist. So. You know, I've, I've always been very driven, maybe ambitious, um, so I've always had that come from within, uh, within myself. And, as, as long as I can remember, maybe even when, as young as five or six years old, people would look at my mom and dad and say, oh my God, you know, it's like the, the fire of the ambition is just coming out of his, his face. And it's, it's less than now having had, you know, one success with Sabre, but I still think it starts with that, that inner desire. But for Merger Deck especially, it starts with that thing I mentioned earlier. I ended up having a real passion. So, you know, I decided that for, for a period of time that I was just going to do non-profit work and give back. And I worked with Mercy Corps on some entrepreneurial projects. and in Kosovo and Israel, which were fantastic. So, I mean, I had a really, really good time. So, that now has become a part of why we do Merger Tech. So, there's this inner inspiration. But then there's this, also this inspiration that says, if you could teach the right four or five basic concepts to an entrepreneur, you know, maybe they come out of it on the other side 
being a serial entrepreneur now, having run a high growth company, kept a lot of the equity, sold it, and then have the time and money to reinvest back into the community. So a lot of projects what I do, as much as 16 hours a week, is basically to continue to foster that community. So, you know, three to four days a week is Merger Tech, but one to two week days is definitely coming up with a Portland 100 concept and working with the city and, and, and the mayor's office and, and maybe even the state treasurer, but definitely the PDC on, on expanding that and, and implementing it, continuing to work with PSU, you know, continuing to work with mentoring the, the entrepreneur. So every time I see that, that continues to inspire me to say, you know, we need to make Merger Tech a really great success for as many entrepreneurs as possible. So that's the inspirational thought in my head that goes through is, I'm going to be probably be part of the top five professional points in every client's life. And that's pretty amazing. When you think of your business that way and say, when every client I work with, hopefully, when they look back at their lives, you probably would have been part of the top five points in their life, which being the sale of their business. That's a pretty inspirational thing. That makes it pretty easy to, to keep going. So, success also always makes it easy to keep going. So, success inspires, of course, more hard work. A lot of people inspire me. I think I try to learn uh, from whoever is around me, you know, uh, a different habit. Um, I'd say from my grandparents, who we would come home and just sit, you know, as they talk business, we'd just play around them. And, Thankfully, I was one of their favorites, so they let me stick around for longer than the cousins stuck around. You, you learn the value of this partnership. So my grandparents, brother and brother, worked together in the business for all their lives. And so that's allowed my brother and me to work together and people just ask me. It's like 10 years at Sabre, then two years off, now two years at Merger Tech. It's incredible, you know, no fighting, incredible amounts of love. So, you know, for my grandparents, I still all, all of them have now passed away. I, I really feel that what was put inside me was just sitting at their feet listening to the business stories of very basic things. Did the product come in? Did the wood and the coal come in? How many trucks came? Were they stocked by any government agencies? Were the taxes paid? You know, did we deliver them to the kilns on time? Have the kilns paid? Which one of our sons is going to go tomorrow to get, collect the cash from the guys who haven't paid? And daily, this eight topics of conversation, right? So though they inspired me. And then I stepped down and uh, my uncle, who was my mom's youngest brother, uh, he ran many of these, these companies and he inspired me with the ambition and drive that he had and so I learned that from him. You know, from my brother I've learned uh, just the ability to stick to it, it you know, uh, his ability to execute and just stay stuck to it till something gets done. And, um, you know, over the last years I've had a difficult year, a year uh, getting through the divorce, I ended up with a new set of friends. I, I would say the startup community here, especially the guys involved in startups, you know, John Fries, Josh Friedman, Paul Anthony, you know, Scott Kavitin at Urban Airship, all these guys in their own individual way are succeeding and helping others succeed. And I'm sure I'm leaving off, you know, a ton of names here, but it's all the guys involved in the startups and startup community here in town have become such incredible friends. Um, and I gained so much from being able to pick up the phone and call any one of them about any issue at all. Um, that I feel really, really fortunate to be part of that here. Mm -hmm.